When you think back of what happened during World War II, where Americans, male and female, from all economic backgrounds and ethnic groups came forward to serve, even when their country and the services they were joining did not treat them the same. And they performed absolutely magnificently under extraordinary circumstances. Our first speaker, uh, Charlie Bolden, the Honorable Charlie Bolden, very good friend of mine. Charlie and I actually went to school together. Charlie was our class president. I'm not going to do his bio, but I would like to just relate two incidences that I think uh, highlight what sort of leader and individual uh, he is. He reminds me of a lot of Admiral Nimitz, where Admiral Nimitz would come in cool, calm, collected most of the time, and a broad leadership. Uh, Charlie and I worked together out at the First Marine Expeditionary Force in California. And at that time, we were having uh, significant aviation problems, accidents. And Charlie took over the wing. And from the time he took over the wing until he left, we had no accidents. Unheard of. And that was direct, involved, calm leadership that re, that uh, caused that significant result. And then after Charlie retired from the uh, Marine Corps, uh, President Obama appointed him as the director of NASA. They had some issues down there. They had some challenges down there. They were looking for a way ahead. And Charlie went down there just like Nimitz went to Pearl Harbor and brought that team together and brought them back to where they are a true national asset now. So I'm really happy to have uh, my good friend, uh, Charlie Bolden here. Charlie, over to you. Uh, General Hege, thank you very much. And I love the, the title for this symposium this year, A Catalyst for Change. Um, we need to think about what that means. Um, you know, a catalyst is something that gets things started. Uh, it, it's a sort of, we see it all the time. I remember it from my high school chemistry. And I also remember it from my time in, uh, in NASA, the space shuttle program, because uh, we had three things called auxiliary power units that, that provided the, the power to drive the hydraulics and the shuttle so that we could fly successfully. And it used a catalyst bed onto which we, we put a, a certain chemical that just caused poof, things to start happening. Uh, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. So uh, World War II represented an opportunity for us to, in this nation, to change dramatically from the segregated nation that we were to the kind of nation that we, that we have the potential to be. I, I was struck by the, the uh, quote from President Roosevelt that's on the cover of, um, of the program for this, and, and I'm going to share it with you. I normally would not do that, but but this is a quote from Franklin Roosevelt, where he said, we have faith that future generations will know here in the middle of the 20th century, there came a time when men of goodwill found a way to unite and produce and fight to destroy the forces of ignorance and intolerance and slavery and the war, unquote. Um, the, the, the key words for me in that, um, we have faith. You know, our nation is founded on an idea, and, uh, and it was an idea of men of, who had faith that following them would be people of like mind who would want to see this nation grow and become the, the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And I, I think we have made great strides to that. As um, several of our recent presidents have said, uh, this is a, a tremendous project. Uh, we're, we're ever in search of a more perfect union. And um, as a person who grew up in the segregated South in the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, I, I have to say that I am concerned about our union and, uh, and our progress toward a more perfect union. But I think that, that probably gives us good reason to sit back and reflect this weekend about what has been demonstrated by our military, uh, where we saw uh, black units come together with white units. Uh, we saw white commanders because there were no black commanders in, 
in, um, in World War II with the possible exception of Benjamin O. Davis, uh, who, who became a pretty early leader in the, as early as the Spanish-American War. But other than that, in my own Marine Corps, General Haiti in my Marine Corps, uh, we had no black officers during the time of World War II. The first one was commissioned, Frederick Branch, uh, commissioned in 1945, pretty close to the end of the war. And he had served in the 51st uh, Defense Battalion, which was one of the, the two all black defense battalions firing um, 140 millimeter and 90 millimeter anti-aircraft guns trained at Monfort Point Camp, who had impressed everyone that saw them and had caused former skeptics to say, these men are ready for war. Uh, so, um, I hope you will enjoy and learn a lot from the discussion this weekend. I hope you will have some incredibly challenging questions for me. Uh, I will tell you that the present Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Dave Berger, um, finds himself not in, an unlike, in a position unlike the earlier Commandants, where he is trying to figure out how we build a better union in our Marine Corps, how we bring Marines together better, how we get rid of some of the bias in, in branches like aviation, where today we have three out of 587 jet pilots who happen to be pilots uh, who, who, are, who are black like me. Um, you know, you, we need to go back and learn a little bit from history, otherwise we're destined to repeat it. So uh, as we go through the weekend, hopefully you will be reminded of or informed about the Navajo Code Talkers, or you will be reminded of or informed of uh, the Japanese who served this nation incredibly well as United States Marines and sailors and soldiers, and of uh, the, the people from around this globe who serve today as members of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Space Force, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps, uh, who serve valiantly uh, to do all that they can to keep us marching toward a more perfect union. So with that, let me stop jabbering and uh, turn the, the mic back over to General Hagee so that we can we can talk a little bit and, and exchange some ideas here with all of you. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Um, you mentioned growing up in uh, growing up in the South, and I know as a uh, which I'm, I get angry every time I think about it. Uh, you were a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps, and you could not find housing in South Carolina, and you could not go into some restaurants. How did you and <laughs> Look at you with that big smile. How? Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that and how you saw things change and how you handled that and what advice do you have on that? Comments on that? Like I think you know because I, I think you 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 met my mom and dad over the four years that we were together at the Naval Academy. But I was blessed to have uh, an incredible set of parents, um, and both of them were career school teachers. My mother had actually founded the first uh, library for black students in Columbia, South Carolina, when, when she was a teacher at Waverly Elementary School. And then my dad became very well known because he was a very successful high school football coach. My mother was my librarian in middle school. My dad was my high school football coach. And you know, I was small like the rest of his team. Uh, we managed to win championships consistently because of his ability to motivate us and to believe in ourselves. He had a saying, it's it's not the size of the fight and the dog, but the size of the dog in the fight. And I remember when he got his first uh, offensive line, well, defensive lineman was a kid named Melvin Alton. And Melvin was 300 pounds. And <laughs> Melvin was almost twice, twice as large as the big guys on our team prior to that time. But Melvin knew absolutely zero about football. And, and my dad used to stand behind him and kind of put his foot on his butt and push him into the holes on the line to help him learn a little bit about how to use that weight. But, but he always, like I said, he always told us, Melvin, you might be big. It's not the size of, not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. And I got to build some fight in you. And that's, you and I are accustomed to that being Marines because that's generally what we try to do is we take America's young men and women from, from all over with all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of beliefs and we mold them into United States Marines and make them people who believe that they can defeat any enemy no matter where they come from. Um, but I, I, my mom and dad always told me, you can do anything you wanna do. Uh, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't. Uh, don't let anyone define you or tell you, uh, you know, who you are or what you are. They, they gave me the opportunity to leave home a couple of times before I left high school 
I, you know, I grew up in an all, all black neighborhood, uh, all black high school and everything. And that was, that was my world, but they wanted me to see more. And so they, they found my mother mainly found out about national science foundation, summer institutes and, and the summer before my junior year, my senior year, um, she helped me uh, get an application together. And I went one summer to a place called North Manchester, Indiana. And I was still one of two blacks there, but it, but it put me in an environment that I, would, I had never seen before, where, where I was, you know, um, there was a young lady and me, uh, both black in the middle of uh, a, a, a part of Indiana where the Church of the Brethren uh, dominated and everything. I learned to, to love cherry, uh, I guess, strawberry pie. And, uh, and other things, but, I, but we studied chemistry there. And then the next summer before I graduated, I was in another National Science Foundation Summer Institute where I was the only black uh, among the students in the program, but we were at Carne then Carnegie Tech in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and, and I found that even when you went up north, uh, there were still customs and traditions that persisted from what I had seen in the south. And again, there, what you had to do was perform and demonstrate that, that you belong. Uh, as I tell young ladies all the time when I, when I address them, don't waste your time trying to convince somebody that you belong or that, that you're qualified. Just do your job and do it the best you can, and people eventually will become, will become acceptable of you. And that's what, you know, when I think back to, to World War II, when the Montford Point Marines were, were brought together and we formed the 51st and 52nd defense battalions. They were sent over to the Western Pacific and there, because there were no black officers, uh, their commanders were always white officers. And the first one was from, was from Texas, the second from South Carolina. And in both cases, they came in with no thought whatsoever that they were gonna be able to lead successful Marines. And as history has shown, each of them left their position saying, boy, you all can handle yourselves with, with, with anybody uh, that we can put up against you. And, and it was because the 51st and 52nd Defense Battalion Marines from Montford Point uh, didn't waste their time talking about what they could do. They demonstrated it with their anti-aircraft artillery weapons. Uh, you know, young Marines of color and women today demonstrated time and again by being the best pilots and squadrons, by being uh, the best riflemen uh, in the field, or by being the best people underwater if they happen to be with force reconnaissance or being the best data systems person. So we're just looking for really good kids that want to be Marines and, uh, and want to prove to people that they, you know, that they can perform. Don't want to talk about it, just want to show them. Yeah, I, I think that's really quite uh, <laughs> insightful advice there. Whether you're going to be a Marine or what you're going to be, a carpenter, uh, just do it and be the very best that you can. A, uh, a question from, uh, uh, from the, our virtual audience, uh, during your service, did you draw inspiration from any specific World War II soldier? You know, um, when I came into the Marine Corps, believe it or not, I had never heard of the Montford Point Marines. And in fact, let me go back because you have to understand, I did not intend to become a Marine. <laughs> uh, when I, I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to be an electrical engineer when I was growing up and I hadn't no idea about going in the military. My father and my uncles had all served in the army in World War II. They had trained at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and they served in segregated units. My dad was a, was a clerk typist uh, who served in Europe and Northern Africa. And like the greatest generation, he nor my uncles talked very much about it at all. So I didn't know a lot about the military. But at the age of 12, I saw a program on, uh, called Men of Annapolis about life at the Naval Academy. And I, I'd never heard of this place but I was just blown away by the images of the campus. And I love the, the uniform with the high white collar. <laughs> and I tell people, I may have been only 12, but I think my hormones were already starting to go because the, the one immature thing that, that impressed me was the fact that all the beautiful girls from all around the mid-Atlantic region came <laughs> to the Naval Academy for the parties and everything on the weekend. So I, I said, that's where I want to go to school. So I, I only applied to very few places. I, I, I knew I needed an appointment to get to the Naval Academy, and that, that looked dimmer and dimmer with every year. In my senior year, when I applied through my two state, my two uh, U.S. Senators, Olin D. Johnston and Strom Thurmond, they made it very clear that there was no way they were going to appoint me. 
And uh, my, my congressional representative was Albert Watson, and he came back with the same thing, no way. But I had really been hoping to get an appointment from Vice President Lyndon Johnson. And what happened in my senior year, November 22nd, uh, my football team was on the bus going to Charleston, South Carolina to play for the state championship when we learned that President Kennedy had been assassinated. And I was devastated, um, not only or mainly uh, because um, I had lost, we had lost the president of the United States, but I knew instantly that any hope I had of going to the Naval Academy had evaporated because I wasn't eligible for an, an appointment from the president. And Lyndon Johnson, who I, I had been counting on and I had been writing for three years, was now the president. Uh, but I didn't give up and I wrote him a letter and I said, Mr. President, this is me again. Uh, we've been talking for several years and I really want to go to the Naval Academy and I need help because I'm not going to get an appointment from South Carolina. Never heard from him. But uh, within weeks, I got a visit from a Navy recruiter who knocked on the door and uh, said, I understand you want to go to the Naval Academy. A few weeks later, President Johnson sent a, a retired federal judge, Judge Bennett, from, D from Washington, D.C., around the country looking for qualified young men of color to go to the Naval Academy. No women were there at the time, so, so that's all they were looking for was men. And, uh, and I ended up getting an appointment from Congressman William Dawson in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm not sure what General Hagee will tell you, but... Uh, when I arrived on the yard, I, I was as thrilled as I could be. And that lasted a few minutes. When we started getting yelled at and screamed at and they shaved my head and everything else, uh, I started thinking, eh, I'm not sure I made the right decision. And through plebe summer, I got to the point that I would call home every weekend when we had a chance and I would cry to my mom and dad and say, look, I made a big mistake. I I'm in the wrong place. I want to come home. And my dad is only he could do as my, my high school football coach. He said one thing to me every single time. It was hanging there one more week. And so for 52 weeks, I kind of hung in there. I made friends. Um, I got accustomed to what was going on and, uh, and struggled through and, and made it. My first company officer was a Marine by the name of Major John Riley Love, who to me was the epitome of leadership. He was like my dad. He was incredibly tough, but unbelievably fair. And uh, so when it came time to graduate four years later, he had long gone, but I decided I wanted to be a Marine. So that's how I came into the Marine Corps. Uh, did not intend to fly airplanes because I thought that was inherently dangerous. But I found out going through basic school along with Mike and some others that I really didn't like crawling around in the mud. And I looked for an, an, an adequate alternative. I was married by then and my wife said, why don't we go to Pensacola? And I said, nah, that's where they have airplanes and I don't want to fly. And she just kept insisting, insisting, insisting. And we finally said, OK, we'll go to Pensacola. And I fell in love with flying the first time I got an airplane. So just for the kids, if there are any kids looking, uh, you know, don't don't ever make up your mind and say never. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. Take advantage of every opportunity that comes to you and, and make the best of it. Uh, I have had an incredible life because I chose to do two things that I said I would never do, become a Marine and go fly airplanes. Long answer to your short question there. No, no, that's quite all right. It's I didn't uh, even though we <laughs> we've been together quite a bit. I didn't realize uh, uh, the the similarities in in our background. I I didn't make the cut to the Naval Academy the first time. Uh, my English was you know, <laughs> look. Jane C. Pot Run, and so I went. Ended up going to University of Texas. That same November, uh, when Kennedy was killed, I was a freshman at uh, UT, and LBJ became president. And the next year, much to my surprise, I got an appointment to the uh, to the Naval Academy. <laughs> so, um, another question from our uh, from our audience here: What advice can you give someone who is nervous about meeting someone of a different ethnic background? Ooh. That's good. The first piece of advice I can give them is that is really good. Uh, you know, if you're if you're feeling perfectly relaxed, um, you're probably not thinking about anything. And and I would say uh, try to relax as much as you can. But but first of all, try to 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 introduce yourself um, and and help put them at ease because I can guarantee you they are just as much concerned about meeting you as you are them. And, uh, and I think if you start that way, there's a, a former NFL football player by the name of Acho, and I, I can't remember his first name, but he, he wrote a book and he now has a podcast called Very Difficult Conversations with a Black Man. 
And, um, and what, he, what he teaches and what he says in his book and in his podcast is um, the, the only way we're going to figure out how to make ourselves better and how to live together is to be willing to sit down and talk to each other about difficult topics. You know, why do I look at you differently? Um, why do you look at me differently? What is it about me that frightens you or what is it about you that frightened me? Because until we are able to admit those facts and talk about them, um, we're not we're really not going anywhere. I, I remember reading President one of President Obama's uh, books when he talks about his grandmother, who he loved dearly. Uh, his, he was raised by his mother and grandmother, who were both white. And he says he remembers um, how crushed he was one day when he saw his grandmother clutch her purse as they passed a young uh, black kid on the streets in Hawaii. And, and he realized that, that even though she loved him dearly and he was a part of her blood, uh, he was different from the young black kid that they were meeting on the street. And, and it caused him to have a discussion with his grandmother. She did not even realize it. But um, I think anytime we're meeting somebody different, it's good to feel a little bit nervous, uh, but it's critically important that we try to engage them in conversation and, uh, and ask the difficult questions in a, in a, in a polite manner um, and, be, and be willing to hear some things that you may not want to hear, but don't take offense. So I have another question. Since you were among a very small minority enter the Naval Academy, is how many were in the class, Charlie? Five, six? We started out, Mike, with seven. And uh, by the time plebe summer was over, we were down to five. Uh, we were down to six. We lost Emerson Carr, who was a football player, uh, after football season when he he said, I'm out of here. And he went back to Minnesota only to turn around and come back again uh, the next year with a class of 1969. And then we lost another football player, Jimmy Frizzell, uh, in the spring because he uh, he actually just couldn't handle it academically. But but we lost uh, we lost two right off the bat in the summertime who just said, I'm not, this is not for me. And we finally ended up with four that we stayed together, Frank Simmons, Buddy Clark, Gil Lucas, and me, and we graduated together. And, um, and Buddy left the, the Navy first as a helicopter pilot, and, and he, we lost him. He passed about three years ago. He was my best man. But Frank and Gil are still alive and kicking on both coasts, and, uh, and we stay in touch all the time. So the, the, the question with that as a lead in is, how did you find the racial landscape slant culture there at that time? There was no racial landscape. It was white. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and as, 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 as soon as I, I made that realization and adjusted to it, um, it, it became a little bit easier. Um, what really made it possible, though, I think for me to get through in spite of the fact that I really wanted to go home was uh, something that now has become routine at the Naval Academy. It's called the sponsor program. Uh, nowadays, any and every midshipman is encouraged to, um, to, to, to allow themselves to be adopted by a local family, um, a family that lives in the Annapolis area. And it provides them a family, a place where they can go on the weekends, um, you know, just to talk or just to sit around and relax, uh, take their uniforms off and put on a pair of shorts or whatever it is. Uh, and it starts in your plebe year or, or the very first freshman year. Um, there was no sponsorship program when you and I went through, Mike, but, but I had a, a, a young mother uh, who lived right outside Gate 3 on College Avenue named Lily Mae Chase. And Lily Mae was a custodian in the museum. And she and her mother had adopted every black midshipman who came through the Naval Academy and opened her house to us on the weekends. And so I could go out there and I could be with, you probably remember Admiral Paul Reason, uh, Paul was was a senior when we were when we were freshmen, and I could go out there and Admiral Reason would be there or or somebody else from the from the class ahead of us, and uh, and we were able to relax and and have people tell us hang in there, um, you know we've seen we have seen others come through and struggle just like you're doing, and it's not the end of the world. Just kind of kind of hold on to what you what you believe in and everything. So so that helped me tremendously. Um, it, again just the, the ability to get together with Buddy and Gil and, and Frank on the weekends um, meant a lot also. And, and I think, you know, we've, we find that all the time. While, while you, don't, you don't want people to stay in groups uh, because of race or anything else, 
everybody needs a companion with whom they can talk easily. So we learned in the Marine Corps a long time ago, if you're going to put a, a woman aviator into a squadron, try to make it two. Uh, try not to try not to isolate them and, and put them where they they've got to defend themselves against all odds and everything. But but um, you know, we, we just adjusted to the landscape, which said we're very we're we're a few among many and uh, grin and bear it. You know, the, uh, I remember an incident uh, when I was a uh, young lieutenant in Vietnam. I was very, very fortunate. I had a uh, company commander. I was a first sergeant. I, uh, I had a first sergeant, uh, African-American, black, had been through boot camp in South Carolina in the 50s. Mm-hmm. And what he told me, what happened to him in there, I was shocked, disgusted, angry. And I remember uh, he and I became very good friends. In fact, he was at my, uh, I brought him back from my change of command. He's a great guy. He made me, he made me a Marine. Um, we were together in San Diego uh, in, the, in the PX and walking together. And he said, oh, uh, sir, just a minute, I'll be right back. And he went over and he shook hands with, uh, uh, with another uh, black Marine. It was in the PX and he came back. I said, that time he was Sergeant Major. I said, Sergeant Major, what just happened? He said, sir, that is the first black officer I have ever seen. And I just wanted to thank him for being a role model for all of us. Now, what you were talking about there is that same thing. The, we really need to have those, uh, those role models. Uh, I've got another question here, but before I go to that one, um, you've had some unbelievable experiences, some good, some bad. You've handled it unbelievably well. If you had a chance to talk with any of the service chiefs right now as they are working to, uh, as you said in your opening remarks, to, to make it better, what, what advice, what, I, what, would you, what, what, would you, what would you say to them, Charlie? You know, I, 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 am, I, am, I, call, I consider it an honor to, uh, to have met General Berger uh, and, and, you know, so that I know the present commandant of the Marine Corps, and, and both of us know lots of former commandants. Uh, since I know you, I know a former commandant, but, uh, you know, you have been the former commandant. And I, the only, we did a study for General Berger on bias in, in, uh, in Marine aviation, right? and that, that led me to make the comment about three blacks of 587 in, uh, in the jet aviation community today, which means that in the, in the blink of an eye, the Marine Corps could be an all-white, uh, you know, tactical aviation force without a single person of color uh, in that force, and I don't think we want to be there. Um, but, but my comment—it's not advice to anybody. My comment is always to to be um, be willing to be the leader and the role model and take uh, responsibility for things that you want to you want to have happen. Uh, be the change that that you want to see made in the organization. You've been the commandant, and, and you remember, if you didn't do it, it didn't happen. And if you didn't push it, it didn't happen. Nobody tried to read your mind and say, well, General Hagee wants us to do this. Some things you wanted to happen didn't happen because, because they were things that, 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 the, that the lieutenant generals, the people below you, didn't agree with you on. And, and uh, you know, you're constantly trying to to find ways to persuade them that this is a good thing to do. When we talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity, um, you know, we've had an opportunity to have this conversation uh, among, uh, well, with General Berger and, and other leaders in the military. And, and the point that, that they always make to me that I fully accept is, I can go around all I want and say, we've got to have diversity and we've got to have inclusion. But my Marines are going to say, why? You know, wh- wh- why do we need to do that? We've never lost a war um, or we've never, Marines have never lost. And, and I say, we don't ever, we can't do what we've done in the past and hope to continue to win in the future. We've got we've to change. We've got to modify the way we do things. And today, the only way to do that is to, to go out and search for, for different ideas and, uh, and different beliefs that make us stronger. And, uh, and I, I asked them to think back on uh, times that they have seen something happen that they never thought would happen and what kind of people were involved in it. In almost every case, 
is somebody that they were not accustomed to, had not known, didn't look like them, didn't think like them, but brought a different idea. Um, and, and you know, I, I, you and I both know that the, the heart and soul of, of the Marine Corps is the individual Marine. And the true leaders of the Marine Corps are the staff NCOs. And when you look at the staff NCO ranks, we don't have the problem of diversity that we have in the officer ranks. And it's because Marines like to follow performers. They, you know, we, people always say Marine, the Marine Corps is a performance organization. Then that, to me, that explains why we see so many black and his, Hispanic and, and uh, Pacific Islander sergeants major in the Marine Corps because they all are performers and Marines recognize that and will follow them to the gates of hell and back. Um, you know, you as, a, as an officer in the Marine Corps, what did they tell us at the Naval Academy? Listen to the gunny and listen and listen to the chief. And if you, and if you fail to heed that, that advice, uh, you're doomed as a leader. And so I, I think we should follow the example that, that our enlisted Marines are showing for us and that it's everybody has a role to play and diversity is critically important. Thanks. Uh, there's another question from the audience. In the current climate, how do you apply the lessons of the past to the present in our divided country? Um, I, I will say either we know and understand history or we're destined to repeat it. So the, the response to the question would be, we have got to go back and find out what the lessons of the past were. Uh, and the only way we can find that out is by looking back to see what, what we did wrong, um, how we allowed ourselves to do it, and how can we overcome that. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at, yeah, I'll give you the example of voting rights. Um, you know, people fought and died for the right to vote. And here we are again in uh, the 21st uh, I got to get my centuries right. The 20, 21st century, I guess. Uh, it, it's like we're back in the 19th century. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're having debates and arguments over voting rights and people uh, in power can't e don't even understand um, ba the basic rights that are granted by the Constitution and, and won't speak up for it. And we learned that lesson before. So we're learning it again. I remember when we... Uh, when we had the first march uh, here in D.C. Uh, after the 2016 elections, and it, I, it was a women's march, and because I have three granddaughters, we went out and you know took them out so they could participate in this women's march. And I, I remember seeing this this little old lady, and she looked like she was about 90, and she had a sign that she was carrying around, and on her sign it said. I can't believe we're doing this effing stuff all over again. <laughs> I thought we had solved these problems, but, but that's because we don't learn the lessons of the past and we allow people to take us back and think that, that it's gonna be different the next time around, that we're gonna find that America is not a, not a land built on an idea and it's not of the people, by the people, for the people. And we don't believe in our motto of e pluribus unum. If, if, that's, if that's the way we really wanna be, then, then let's just admit it and. Let, let people like me go somewhere else and, and find a better place to live. But I don't, I don't, I'm not ready to give up my country yet. No, I don't, I don't the large majority are not, I don't believe. Uh, during your early service, did you notice the same racial tension toward other minority groups like Asian or Native American? You know, Mike, I'll, I, that is a, that question is painful because, um, um, I can remember my four years at the Naval Academy, the person who I felt was persecuted and, uh, and just trampled more than anybody else in the company was not me. I was only black in the company, but we had a, we had a, we had a kid by the name of Alex Lay, who was of Chinese descent. Uh, Alex, I don't even know if he'd ever been to China, but he had come from, uh, his ancestry was Chinese and, uh, it started, the moment the brigade came back, um, we had some firsties who just were unmerciful in the way that they treated him and it never went away. And it persisted because some of my classmates, some of your and my classmates who had uh, sort of been trained by these, uh, and I'll just call them racist firsties, um, they, they kind of adapted, adopted some of the other stuff. So, so a Alex Lay is a person that I feel poorly about every single time I think about it because because I didn't step up and say something, uh, you know, or defend him 
but but I'm you know I I just didn't know what I could do. But I I witnessed um, the way that he was treated, which which made the way that people approach me. I mean, I, I that was dwarfed by the way that he was treated. You know, you, you talk about that and you and and you talked about we have to learn from history. I just finished reading the book uh, Facing the Mountain, which deals with the Japanese from the uh, Japanese Americans uh, before 7 December and after 7 December. And a short story that uh, the group that was actually going over to Italy were tra- where they were training in Alabama. These were Americans, Japanese descent, and there was a German POW camp there, uh, very close to the base. Mm. And some of them, some of the, they were working for some of the farmers. The German POWs, who had actually been shooting Americans just a few weeks before, were treated better than the Japanese Americans getting ready to go to Italy to try to kill Germans. Uh, From the audience. During your NASA piloting days, and then later as administrator uh, uh, of NASA, what was the biggest challenge you might have encountered around diversity and inclusion? Was there a parallel challenge you had to address uh, address similar to what you experienced in the Marine Corps? Um, I think they were identical. To be quite honest, it was, um, uh, and and it will. Unfortunately, it probably we will be battling this until both of us are no longer walking around on this planet because of some of it's human nature. But um, again, the biggest challenge I found was the people. Um, and, and, and the challenge in that was trying to help them understand much the same as, you know, you were an infantry Marine. So you had this in spades to what I did as an aviator but trying to convince the young private private first class that the mission we're about to go on is important and, uh, and, and, and it will make a difference. Um, and I, what I always tried to do everywhere I've been is help people understand, help them contribute uh, to the planning that's going on so that they feel that it's their idea or at least that, that part of it is their idea. And we, we approach diversity and inclusion the same way in NASA, and I did it in my units in the Marine Corps, the same way, trying to, to help people internalize what it was that, that we were about to undertake and why it was important. Um, because people tend to support things if, if they can believe in it. I, I think the, one of the reasons we're having so much difficulty uh, with, with race relations again today and, and diversity is because people don't believe that it's important at all. They've been told that if they can just get rid of a group of people, things will be so much better. And they don't recognize the greatness of our nation is due to the fact that we are so diverse and that it, it's the diversity of the people who built this nation that makes us so great. You know, and I look at, if I look at NASA, um, you know, I, I shudder to think what we would be like today were it not for the women who were the human computers, white and black. They, they were, they were women of all creeds and colors, not just the black women that you saw in the movie Hidden Figures, but, but these were the women who were doing the manual calculations for us to send humans to space in the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo days. Uh, and they were there because men just could not do that kind of, weren't interested in doing that kind of tedious work. Uh, they were the engineers and the big thinkers, but somebody had to be in the back room doing the tedious work of calculation and stuff until computers came along. Um, I, when I, I, I remember as a shuttle commander going, or not as a shuttle crew member, going to visit a place called Mechanical Products in Jackson, Michigan, little bitty town in Michigan, and Mechanical Products made every single circuit, every single circuit breaker in the space shuttle. That's thousands of circuit breakers, big ones, little ones, everything. It was a company of 300 people, one man. The man owned it. And every single employee was a woman. And the reason he hired women, and he had three generations of women, was because they were the only people who had the patience uh, to do the tedious work of putting together the circuit breakers, uh, you know, the components that had to be done, the pieces and parts that had to be done manually. Now, my guess is today we figured out a way to automate that so, so, so that one man is running a bunch of robots. But, but back then, I was just blown away when I went to Mechanical Products in Jackson, Michigan, and, uh, and there was this 
this this company of nothing but women and one man that made every single circuit breaker in my space grant. Well, a follow on question then to that is, do you feel that women joining the armed forces are received by their military commanders better now than in the past? And can we do better? We can definitely do better. That, that, that's easy to answer. Uh, are they received better now than in the past? Well, after talking to people like Lieutenant Colonel Lori Reynolds that, that you know very well um, and others, they tell me, much as I would say to someone uh, as, a, as an African-American, things are much better than they were when I started, but things are still bad. Um, so we're still in search of the more perfect union. When, and, and all you need to do is look at numbers. You, and I keep going back to this tactical aviation in the Marine Corps. Uh, that's an unsatisfactory number by any measure. Um, and we've got to do better. We can do better. Um, so, so yes, we can do better. Uh, it is better than it used to be, but, but we've got a long way to go because many women in the Marine Corps and in other organizations, I mean, women at, at NASA, um, one of the things that, that I still want to see is a, is a woman administrator. Um, I, I thought I would see someone follow me, uh, you know, uh, a woman, because my, my two deputies, I had two deputies, both were women, and, uh, and, and especially the second one that, that was with me when I left, um, she could run the agency today, and my chief scientist could run the agency today, and she's now the vice secretary of the Smithsonian. Um, you know, so, so they leave NASA, and they leave the Marine Corps, and they leave these, these organizations that are dominantly run by men and they go off into industry and stuff and they become CEOs and, 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 and executives. So there is no question they can do it. I, I, I was reading about um, the Marine Corps searching, struggling to, uh, to find a way to commission a black commissioned officer during, you know, at the end of World War II, when uh, Fred Branch was finally commissioned on the Marine Corps birthday in 1945. Before that, I think there had been six Blacks, almost all of them were sergeants, major, first sergeants and the like, who couldn't qualify, who couldn't pass the test and the like. And, and yet almost every single one of them left the Marine Corps. One became a doctor, one became a lawyer. You know, they all went out and became leaders and owners in business, and, which says something about the Marine Corps, not about the individual. And, and so okay. we, we've, got a, we've got a little bit more work to do. You said you didn't know what to do at the time to help your friend Alex. That's how people feel now. Yeah. What can one person do? Hey, one person can do it a lot. I get emotional about this part. And, and it's because, oh, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> and, it, and I think it's because I know very well how difficult it is to have the courage to speak up because I didn't have the courage to speak up for four years when I saw him struggle. Um, I remember President Jimmy Carter talking about um, his classmate, um, you know, um, I, think he, I think he was classmates with Wesley Brown. And he talked about watching him struggle through the Naval Academy and never, never coming to his side or speaking up for him or the classmates of Hyman Rickover who uh, watched him be abused his entire time through the Naval Academy and, and the people who built the lucky bag, if the rumor is true, the, the myth is true, that they allowed it, the page with his, his story and biography on it to be perforated so that, that members of his class who didn't want to have a Jew in, the, in their lucky bag could rip that page out. Um, Charlie? Yes. It's true. I, it's true. I've seen such a book. I, I it's mean, true. I, Unfortunately, it's true. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's the example I give you, Mike. I, I struggle uh, to, to, to give advice to somebody else when I didn't follow whatever advice I'm going to give them myself for four years. But I, but I say now um, I have to have the courage to speak up and I have to have the courage to have that very difficult conversation with a white man or a white woman who, who I may not understand, but I know doesn't understand me. There, in this audience today uh, are patriots, true patriots, but they don't, they don't buy my story. They don't, they don't buy my act about diversity being important. And I, all I can say to them is take, take a little bit of time to talk to somebody who's different than you and find out uh, you know, what's going through their mind and, and, and what they've done to contribute to this great country of ours. And, and if, if after that you can't bring yourself to believe that they are 
um, you know, deserve to be with you and, and by you and, and helping you to make this country better, I, I'm not sure I, I know what to do. I, I, Charlie, I think uh, I know I've been there when I should have said something and I didn't. And I can rationalize it, but I but I should have said something. Uh, and like you, I am trying hard, have been trying hard to always speak up. I just uh, I saw an interview with uh, Yo Yo Ma. I'd like your con, yeah, I'd like your comment on this. My as you know, my wife is a cellist, and uh, we watched Yo Yo Ma being interviewed. And the guy said, "You know, you're the best cellist in the world." He said, "No, I'm not." He said, no one is the best because if you're if you care about anything, sort of what what you talked about, you're always trying harder to be better. So there is don't tell me I'm the best. There is no best. And he says, I don't even consider myself a musician as the person I am. And the interviewer didn't know what to say. He said, well, what do you consider yourself to be? He said, the first thing I consider myself to be is a human being and you know he's chinese lived in france uh a human being and i think that's what you're talking about (laughs) look at the individual as a human being if you do that all this other stuff disappears (laughs) it's hard (laughs) we you and i both know that you're absolutely right and it and it you know was um i don't i cannot remember who i was having the discussion with but but it was during the study for the commandant and I, and it was somebody who has never been a Marine in their life, but they, um, they, they, they mentioned to me, they said, you know, you ought to, he said, you of, of all people should understand that you're an earthling. Uh, you know, you've been to space. So you of all people should understand that you are an earthling. You're a person of this planet and, and you're one of many who, who, who help keep and preserve this planet so that we can stay alive on it and survive and thrive. And, uh, and you need to quit calling yourself, uh, you know, black or, or South Carolinian or an American or whatever else and say, I'm an earthling who happens to be from the United States. And so I, um, every once in a while, I tell people I'm an earthling. And, and, but, I, but that's exactly what, what you're talking about and, and what Yo-Yo Ma is talking about. You know, we, we did something while I was at NASA People used to use the term best practice when we when we compared ourselves with industry or other international agencies, we always wanted to find quote unquote best practices. And then we finally realized that, you know, there, there probably are no best practices. There are promising practices. There are things that people do uh, that if we adopt them and we try them for us, they may work even better than they did for them. They may also not work at all because of the culture of our organization or something. So, so if it doesn't work for us, then it can't be best. But, uh, but we turn to using the term promising practices. And so as we try to, be, to stri- struggle for this more perfect union and try to be better citizens of our country, I would say that we struggle uh, to follow promising practices of others around us who seem to be doing a little bit better at, at, at this more perfect union thing than we are. I have a comment here from a, a hero. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's a he or a she, but uh, this person is in the classroom teaching. And she says, I don't have a question, but my only rule in my classroom is be a good human. It's all capitalized. I tell my kids, we all have to be human beings. So be a good one. Um, I'm going to combine a couple questions here because we're just about out of airspeed and altitude. Uh, (laughs) Do you have a favorite story from your time as CEO or director of NASA? Oh, yeah, I do. Believe it or not. It is so trivial. But it's um, it's a it's a story of failure. I hate it when people say that NASA's uh, NASA's motto is is failure is not an option. That is not true. Uh, Gene Kranz, who who is credited with having said that, said it under a unique circumstance when we found out that the side of the service module had been blown out when the oxygen tank exploded in Apollo 13, and that we 
the, the chances were greatly against us being able to get the crew safely back to Earth, that they were probably going to die. Um, Gene Kranz had the doors locked to mission control, and he told the, the flight control team, nobody's getting out of here until we find a way to get this crew back home because failure is not an option. So everybody, you know, liked that phrase and began to say that, which causes people to look at NASA as an organization that's, a, that's afraid to, that's risk averse. And, and, and I know from living in it, we are, that's nothing could be farther from the truth. The Marine Corps is definitely not risk averse. You know, we are always experimenting and trying new things. But I had be, tried to really tell my people that the, my first couple of years, and we had a, pro, a program called Morpheus. It was a little project where we were experimenting with a methane powered um, lunar lander. Um, um, uh, it was a prototype. And uh, we had brought together a lot of young engineers from all over NASA, from every center and everything, because we wanted to have a very diverse group. We didn't want to have any group think. And it took them a while, but they came up with this prototype and they tested it and tested it and tethered it and launched it and it flew and did everything. And they, uh, the, the, the program manager who had been one of my trainers when I was in the astronaut office said, he, he gave me a call. He said, you know, we're, I just wanted to let you know, sir, we're, we're getting ready to go down to Kennedy with this thing and we're going we're gonna to launch it and we're going to untether it and we're going to let it fly and bring it back and land it uh, on the runway at the Kennedy Space Center. And I said, you know, you you think you're ready? He said, I, he said, I really am. He said, now you need to know there are no redundancies on this thing. It's all single string. So, you know, we put this together. It, it's cheap. He said, so if something happens, it's my fault. And, and I said, no, it, if something happens, it's all of our fault because we, we understand what we're doing and that's okay. And uh, this was going to be a really quiet test. And um, so that morning they, they went down to the end of the runway of the Kennedy Space Center and they took the tether off and they got ready to power it up. And, uh, and I looked around, I wasn't there, but, but looking on the, on the camera and I saw all these other cameras, Aviation Week was there, Time Magazine was there, the New York, I mean, the word had gotten out. So everybody on the planet was there to see NASA launch this lunar landing prototype. And they went through the countdown in five, four, three, two, one, and it lifted off and it got, I don't know, didn't even get a hundred feet up and it <laughs> turned over and boom, came back down and crashed and burned to a crisp. And uh, I mean, I could just, you know, even though I wasn't there, you could see on the camera, the face of dejection on all these young kids. And uh, so I got on the phone and I called and I said, Hey, do me a favor. I said, go out and tell your team. Um, I'm really proud of them said, uh, they briefed me, they, I, knew what, I knew the risk we were taking. Um, you, you know, go ahead and cry and get it out of your system, but go back out there, gather up the, the, the pieces and parts and go back and figure out what went wrong and get back at it. And I'll be damned if they didn't go out and they figured out that it was something really simple where they had forgotten a lesson we learned on the very first space shuttle launch about acoustic energy, about the damage that sound can do to things. And so they fixed it and came back out several months later, had a successful flight. And today, uh, missions that we fly to the moon and Mars actually use some of the, the systems that we were able to test on Morpheus. But, but you know, had they given up, had they, had, they, had they not been able to accept the fact that that was a pretty good failure because it helped us to build a, an even better system. So that, that's my favorite NASA story. Is a story well, I, I, I actually think that's a great story, uh, actually, to finish on. You normally learn more from your failures than your successes. So having a few failures along, and we've all had failures, we learn a great, uh, great deal. Charlie, uh, this has been fun talking with you. You are a real American treasure and hero. I have been, uh, I enjoyed knowing, I enjoy knowing you. I enjoyed working with you and hopefully I'm pretty sure it will continue. Thank you very much for uh, your comments today. No, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to do this. And, and again, thanks to the museum for, for do, you know, for putting on this program, give my best to Silka. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Jackie. Bye. Bye. Okay.